This is Living Catholic with Father Don Wolf. Living Catholic is a fresh look at issues confronting each of us today. This show deals with living Catholic, what that means for Catholics, as well as the impact on the rest of society. You certainly don't have to be Catholic to enjoy this show. And now your host, Father Don Wolf. Welcome, Oklahoma, to Living Catholic. I'm Father Don Wolf, pastor of Sacred Heart Parish and the uh, Shrine of Blessed Stanley Rother in Oklahoma City. This is Easter. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. This is the proclamation at the heart of the Christian claim. Jesus, the Son of God, came among us to proclaim the kingdom of God in our midst. In his claim, he he embodied all he announced so as to bring the kingdom into being by his proclamation of it. And the heart of his announcement, including the response by the world, the powers of this world, unwilling to surrender their leverage of death and destruction, conspired to put him to death as an enemy to his religion and as a threat to the state. But in the triumph of this kingdom, he broke the bonds of death and rose from the dead. This is what we celebrate, and this is what what brings us hope. With the power of death broken, we can now live our lives in freedom and by way of hope. Easter is our day. It is the day of hope for all who believe. Now, we all know the Christian story as well as we know the narratives about Christmas. We don't celebrate them as a society with the same elan that we invested in Christmas, but Easter is still well-known and well-recognized among us. In our day and time, it's greeted with more skepticism than before, but it's still a major feast day. Our society can get behind the birth of a child in different difficult circumstances, and can feel good about the triumph of a dedicated mother and her faithful husband and celebrate it all with with much enthusiasm, much more so than it can affirm that a man rose from the dead. After all, it's easy to affirm a birth. To affirm the resurrection is to lean into the reality of faith, and we seem to have grown allergic to such leaning. But as all of us in Oklahoma know, we can live with allergies. Easter is still an important marker on our roadmap of the year, even among those for whom faith is not the first concern. The elements of this story, the one that we know so well, are easy to tell. The women come to the tomb. They're puzzled to find it empty. And in their puzzlement, they receive a message to return to Galilee. On their way from the tomb, they encounter the risen Christ. It's a stunning message, one that transforms them and ultimately transforms the world. However, there is an aspect of the many elements of this story that we often miss. This repeats itself often in in the variety of stories we have and in all the post-resurrection accounts from the Gospels. We do well to pay attention to this aspect as we regard the resurrection from our vantage point. After all, we stand more than 20 centuries removed from what happened on that Sunday morning. We should make the best use of what we have in order that the gift of resurrected life can, so that it can be all it can be for us. Not taking note is to allow this gift to remain unwrapped. So we should pay attention. And the first thing to notice is that no one expected to see anything unusual when they arrived at the tomb. The women arrived first in the dark of the morning because they had come to prepare the body for burial. Because they were women, they could slip through the midst of dawn without arousing any suspicion on the part of the guards who were there to keep the peace in that difficult time. A cohort of men moving through the dark on their way to the grave of a man who had been executed for revolutionary treason, that would have been a threat. A group of women was nothing. Women were social non-entities. Their presence signaled only the weak nature of their silly piety, not a threatening dedication to a reputed messiah. They went through the dark of the morning in order to prepare the body for proper burial. They weren't thinking they'd find anything except what what one finds in graves, the dead. And although the Gospels record Jesus' predictions about his death and resurrection, nobody seemed to have paid much attention to it. Several times in the Gospel, as an explanation, the narrators say that when they experienced it, then the disciples remembered Jesus' words but they certainly didn't grasp what he was saying when it was said. So they came to the tomb with the fullest expectation to find only death in its ghastly outcome. They were bent over with their responsibility to do their women's work and make their loved one respectable in death. They also went through the dark to their work without a plan on how to roll the stone back. In the first century, all that was done was done by muscle, either human or equine, 
and they knew that they didn't have what they needed to begin their work. This seems like a minor matter and so is swallowed up in what happened when they arrived, but the narration includes their uncertainty about exactly what they were going to do once they got there. They went to the tomb based on their conviction they needed to do what they could, as women of their time, for their friend. They hadn't worked out the details. They went on what? Faith? As they glided through the dark of the morning, they arrived with the expectation that something would happen to allow them to do what they needed to do. And I wonder if this isn't a lesson to most of us who spend our lives preoccupied by the details of preparation and the minutiae of getting by. Whatever this detail meant from them, it's a reminder that for the first participants in the resurrection on that first Easter, they didn't arrive with everything prepared and with all their bases covered. They arrived filled with uncertainty about what would happen next. Maybe that's the prerequisite for all things of the Spirit happening at all. So when they arrived and saw the stone rolled back and the tomb empty, they had no words. Nothing was as it should have been. We can excuse their surprise. What would be the models for their behavior? Who in the world would have seen what they were seeing? They had come expecting death in its finality, and what they got was something different. What they were seeing wasn't conforming, and it wasn't comforting or hopeful. It was unsettling to them. And we should admit it was creepy. That may sound odd, given the setting was their preparation of Jesus' body for a decent burial, but it was true. As women of their time, they were used to dealing with the certainty of death. They were versed in what to expect and how to act. Of all of the expectations of their time and place, dealing with dead bodies was women's work, and they knew what they had to do. Who knows what their experience of this ultimate finality had been already for them in their families, but no doubt they had handled the necessary details many times before. And being women, they had no doubt been involved with others in the difficulties of this assignment in their families and villages. While no one would describe this as easy work, it was part of the sum of their experience. When they got to the tomb, however, it was empty. When confronted by the emptiness, there was the hovering suspicion that began to grow among them, a suspicion that easily could have turned to horror. After all, the creepiest horror shows have to do with the unknown as it interrupts the unexpected. All it takes is the slightest variation of what we come to expect, and suddenly there, rooms the, there looms the potential for anything. Once when I was a pastor at the parish in Mangum, I came back from my regularly scheduled Mass on Thursday evening from Hobart. It was about 11 o'clock. The clouds were scudding across a three-quarters moon, and I pulled up to go into the rectory. It was an old, odd two-story house that had been built about 80 years previous. The exterior walls were made out of cast-off brick from the local brick factory, which gave it an out-of-the-ordinary, unsquared tilt and a jagged, harsh look. It also had large, symmetrical windows on the second floor, which gave it a seemingly brooding look over the isolated street running past the front door. And the roof sagged a bit, which made it look tired. By all appearances, it was ominous from the outside. In truth, it was warm, watertight, and a comfortable place to live. But as I went up to the door to unlock and go inside in the half-light of uh, the gathering night, I said to myself, no wonder nobody breaks in here or to steal things. The whole place looks haunted. The neighbors have a right to feel unsettled by it. For me, though, it was home. There was nothing scary or menacing about it. However, one day I came home in the afternoon and the back door was open. There, weren't, there were no cars there and no indication that somebody had come by. Looking at the open door with no notion of what might have happened or could happen, that made a chill run down my back. Facing the unknown, even in the middle of the day, was enough to make me pause for a moment. And the open door was the opening to imagine almost anything could be lurking there. That was unsettling for me. Now, while my experience was only a tiny portion of the surprise of the women at the tomb, still they had a similar reaction. Facing the stone rolled back, the dark of the empty tomb, they also faced the truth that it could mean almost anything. And the worst place to be when anything is a possibility is a garden where bodies are buried. They weren't thinking about the object of their faith, nor were they suddenly awake to what Jesus may or may not have said. 
More than anything, they were stirred by fear. Now, what happens next is unclear. In Mark's gospel, they went inside to see a young man sitting there in the tomb. In Matthew's gospel, there was an earthquake and the angel of the Lord appeared to them. In Luke, the tomb was empty. And as they were puzzling about it, two men appeared in dazzling garments. And in John, Mary Magdalene saw that the tomb was empty and then later saw the risen Jesus as well as an angel. In all of the accounts, it appears that they discovered the empty tomb and then they also found themselves visited by a messenger to tell them what had happened. These stories have this in common. They had to have someone explain to them what took place. Simply seeing the tomb empty wasn't enough to prompt them to do some kind of explanation on their own. They were witnesses to Easter, and by their testimony, we have the story of the fact of the resurrection. But it wasn't simply the recounting of what they saw that makes the difference for them. They were also given the explanation by someone else. They had to know the explanation before they could understand what they were seeing. That is a sophisticated bit of storytelling. At least it is for those of us who are schooled in our convictions about seeing and knowing. Because in our age, we're taught that when we encounter something, we should know it and appreciate it for what it is immediately. And if we don't, we're at fault. In fact, we are highly judgmental of those who don't understand when they see. Our national political drama is full of the accusation that everyone who sees should understand. And we have no patience with those who don't. It's now common, for example, to criticize any parent or official who encounters a troubled child and doesn't intervene to comfort the child, according to the understandings we currently have in our childhood needs. Now we attack bishops and priests who are blind to the realities of child sexual abuse going on in their midst because we're confident in asserting that anyone should have been able to understand what was really happening, even when no one involved told the truth or even knew the truth. It should have been obvious for them, we say. But now when a child comes forward to describe discomfort with his or her stage in life, or even the trajectory of their physical development, it's now regarded as abusive not to affirm the child's feelings, no matter how outrageous they seem, and no matter how out of sync they are with the sum of all human experience up to a few years ago. Parents have even been denied the care of their children because the state claimed they were too blind to understand what they were seeing and therefore were abusive to their kids. We brook no excuse and have no patience with those who claim not to understand what they see. But in the Gospels, the message is clear. As they stood by looking at the empty tomb, they needed an explanation in order to make sense of what they were seeing. Each of the Gospels, uh, in each of the Gospels, the story was eventually unfolded to them. Jesus was no longer among the dead. He was raised up. And they would see him because he had preceded them to Galilee. That is, they went back home ahead of them. They, what, they, what they made of the information was up to them. The messenger had done his job by delivering it to them. Not only was what they saw unexpected, it took time to digest. The first response was a continuation of their anxiety and puzzlement. In Mark's gospel, the women left the tomb very much afraid. Getting the, comfort, the, getting the message was of no comfort to them. In all the gospels, as they began to spread the news, it didn't cause anyone much relief. No one knew what to make of it. As we might expect, it wasn't an easy bit of communication to digest. And all we know that and all we know is that when unexpected news hits, there are those who make sense of it by becoming angry at it. As odd as it might sound, there were those among the disciples who would have been angry that this new fact made it hard to get on with life, even a life of devastation and disappointment because new facts make for unexpected challenges. We don't like unexpected challenges. No wonder the Gospels record that there were those who were afraid and fearful. And then the appearances began. The risen Christ began appearing to people. Again, they most often needed a prompt to understand what they were seeing. When Mary Magdalene was at the empty tomb and Jesus approached her, she didn't recognize him. It was only when she heard his voice that she could make sense of what, they were, of what both of them were seeing. On the road to Emmaus, the disciples who met the stranger on their journey had no idea who it was until late in the day when he rose and broke bread with them. 
even then it took that overwhelming prompting for them to understand that it had been the risen Christ with them all day long. The disciples were gathered in the upper room. They doubted who it was until they saw the wounds on his body. They were uncertain about what they were seeing because it became blindingly clear. It was literally the case that those who saw him did not know him. They didn't know what or who they were seeing. Only as they came to understand more of their, their circumstances and his did they begin to see. Whatever the risen Christ had looked like, he was hard to recognize. They didn't know him at first. And the culmination of this final scene in Matthew's gospel, in which, Jesus's, uh, in which Jesus appears to the gathered disciples for his final message to them, he has been appearing throughout many days and many separate appearances, and he commands them to gather, in a, not, um, to gather on a mountaintop so that he can speak to them. When they are gathered, he appears to them. And according to the gospel, they bowed down before him when they saw him, but it says, some still doubted. After all that time and all the different aspects of witnesses they had heard they had and had seen for themselves, some of them still doubted it was he. None of us can describe what they were seeing or communicated or understood themselves what they were looking at when they encountered him. But whatever it was, it didn't result in overwhelming, unquestioning acceptance. Matthew is describing the last appearance in the gospel. It's not clear when their doubts were created. Perhaps for those who knew the apostles personally, they knew when and how they were all to come together to believe. The process isn't recorded in the Gospels. Perhaps those who knew the, uh, all, none of us can describe what they were seeing, but it wasn't unquestionable certitude. It's not clear when their doubts were erased. Perhaps the, when the people who knew the apostles personally, they knew when that happened in the Gospel, but the process isn't recorded. These elements in the descriptions bring us to one aspect of the descriptions most important for our faith, and that is this, that those who arrived at the tomb on Easter morning and those who saw the risen Christ during the days after the resurrection, they have no advantage over those of us who are now 2,000 years removed from these facts. We're the same people, we're asked to digest the same challenges, and we're confronted with the same truths as those who made their way through the dark of the morning all those years ago in Judea. The resurrection is not merely a fact of history, it's a fact of everyday life, even today. We learn about the resurrection by reading the scriptures and listening to others who explain it to us. As we go through the celebrations of Easter, we're helped along with the testimony of those who did see Jesus, and we depend upon what they've told us. We're left to trust what happened once the resurrected Christ stood amidst them in the light of day by way of their testimony to us. St. Paul could choose to remind the people he was writing to that they could ask around about the hundreds of people who had seen Jesus resurrected. They would tell the truth of what they had seen and experienced. But we don't have that assurance. We're left to trust what these others have witnessed to us. And for many people, this seems like a thin reed on which to place their faith. Depending on this fragile testimony of those from so long ago makes it seem as if we have only the merest chance to quash our doubts. It's no wonder there are so many who have chosen not to believe in our day and time. We're asked to stake our belief on what has been communicated to us through the fuzzy testimony of witnesses from centuries ago. And that can be tough. There are three responses, though, to those doubts. And the first is that the questions and anxieties we have are actually anticipated in the stories. All of those who were there, including the women who came to the tomb, shared them. Having doubts about what it all means is part of the experience. If we have them, we're just as the disciples were. Doubts shouldn't be the end of our religious encounter with the Lord. It should be the beginning. At least that was the case for those who did believe. The second is that we are always dependent upon the witness and testimony of others. Virtually everything we know is built on the fragile read of testimony and trust. This is true of the facts of science as much as, as it is on the insights of sociology or the claims of history. When we repeat the formula, for example, E equals MC squared, we do that from our trust in the testimony we have from people whom we rely on. I've never validated that formula, which is about 100 years old now. In fact, I have no idea how I would validate it on my own. Ultimately, I trust the testimony of those who tell me of it 
of its validation and its derivation, because I have no other way to do it. And at least 99% of the people who talk about it or who would point to it as a fact of our civilization, also, they couldn't prove that it was true on their own. They have to take it also on trust. The same is true of the presidency of Abraham Lincoln, the purity of treated water, the efficacy of vaccines, who won World War I, and what was the actual paternity of my father. Just about everything that predates me, I have to take on trust, on trust of the testimony of others. One of the great dramas of our civilization is that we more or less regularly enter into a cycle of doubt when someone claims they have been misled into trusting someone or something that has turned out to be false. All of this highlights how much we depend on testimony and witness and how little our actual self-engaged experience we have. Yes, testimony is a weak read. Alas, it's the only one on which we have to stand. Which brings us to the final point. Reads may be weak, but if there are, not, there are enough of them together, they make for a strong hand on which to stand. And our faith in the resurrection is a strong read. Ultimately, the basis of the resurrection is the basis of the whole of the faith. And it relies exactly on what happened in the pages of the New Testament when the disciples began to recount what they had experienced. Their experience of what they had seen and heard they touched the lives of those around them who handled, handed on to them what they had seen and heard, to those who testified to them and on others, generation after generation until us. We are those who have inherited this message. It's the same message as to the women on Easter morning. Jesus has risen from the dead. The powers of death do not hold him. And all that has been promised in the kingdom he came to preach is now true and present. Christ are tested to by those whom we trust and who are telling the truth. Just like those who wondered what it all meant, we've been entrusted with the message of the, of the promise of Christ to all people. Easter Sunday is Easter Sunday. The resurrection of Jesus the crucified is happening among us. He who once was dead is alive and he is present to us. That's what we believe. And that's what makes this a happy Easter. Back in just a moment. Welcome back to our final segment, Faith in Verse. We have a poem today called The Invisible Spirit. The invisible spirit we wait upon, along with Blessed Father and Holy Son, the all-invisible Holy One, we are to serve with enthusiasm. This promise is greater than we know, is to heal us, to bring us whole, into the kingdom amid the low glories of greatness that here inflow. But there's nothing easy now, blocked as we are, nothing allows us to see its beauty as it flowers, even in our promise and vows, and are left to ourselves to lie upon the certainties we know by, the sharpened gaze of our confident eye that we may upon the truth rely, until by careful assurance we can assert most confidently God's life and presence preemptorily is the very heart of us, of me. That's the invisible spirit. This is, like I said, the heart of the faith. It is what is the basis of all that we believe, Jesus risen from the dead, the powers of death could not hold him. This is true also in our lives, we who are baptized. This is what we celebrate on Living Catholic. I hope you can join us in the weeks to come. Living Catholic is a production of Oklahoma Catholic Radio. To learn more, visit OKCR.org.